I'm going to tell you guys today a little bit about environmental science and resource management from my perspective. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean Anderson. My background uh, is was at coming at this uh, subject originally not from a scientific perspective. I originally did not I uh, really see myself as being a scientist. I thought scientists were dispassionate and not really engaged uh, folks and, and very standoffish. And uh, I, I, over the course of my undergraduate career, came to realize that wasn't the case and you could do um, great work and, and be passionate and still be a scientist. I started my, my academic career at UC Santa Barbara, was an undergraduate there and began volunteering originally in a lab and then um, worked up to working part-time there, got my research scuba certification and eventually um, ran the lab full-time once I graduated. I then uh, did some things, went to Antarctica, dove under the ice for a while on a, on a research project there and eventually landed in graduate school at UCLA where I did mostly subtitle research for my PhD. Worked out on Catalina Island. I simultaneously worked on a project at Magoo Lagoon in the wetlands here in Ventura County where I um, helped des design and, and do the restoration and then ultimately assess the, the success or failure of a, a series of restoration projects on the naval base. Before we get going and talking about uh, the subject here, I want to just flag a few things. Um, now, this is, it's unclear if, this, uh, if we're actually going to the Cook Islands. I've yet to hear if we got funding, so this may well not happen. If we, if we do get funding, we'll have, be having a two-week trip over the summer to the Cook Islands to look at the management and ecology of this um, uh, one particular South Pacific island called Aitutaki. By way of preparation for that trip, we're offering a class ESRM 43, which is going to be um, a general overview of the management of Pacific Islands. So uh, that's going to be Thursday evenings this coming semester. First time we've taught it. I really encourage you guys to think about maybe taking this. Uh, if the class, does, if we don't get funding, this class will still go on. If we do get funding, though. Whoever takes this class will be given preferential enrollment into our Cook Islands trip. Um, again, assuming we get funding for that. Another example of the kind of new classes we're rolling out this spring and on into next year is our special topics class, ESRM 490, which will be the first time we teach this class starting uh, next year. It'll actually be its own standalone number. But we have been doing more and more with so called remotely piloted systems both underwater, ROVs, and up in the air, unmanned aerial systems. And we're going to be doing our first uh, attempt at showing you guys how to use these systems. This is, this is a group of our students last spring doing a demonstration. Um, uh, these tools are becoming really cheap, really off the shelf, and we think you guys need to begin to be prepared to use these instruments to help with coastal monitoring. So not to pry into someone's privacy or to do some kind of law enforcement activity, but rather to help us uh, document changing vegetation, lagoon mouths, uh, survey marine mammals, all that kind of stuff that we can do uh, much, cheap, much more cheaply with these types of instruments that cost a few thousand dollars as opposed to having to hire an airplane or something of that nature. So if you're interested, ESRM 490 is going to be taught this fall. Uh, uh, Friday mornings, 9 to noon, covering everything from legal issues to safe flying to data collection. In general, many programs, academic programs, classically break apart their research from their teaching and from their service. So research would be the academic um, scholarship we do, the teaching is obviously teaching classes, the service is either service classically defined either service to our academic organizations or the broader public. In our case, in the case of ESRM, these things are really hard to separate out. And our research interacts tightly with our teaching, which interacts tightly with our service. Everything is all integrated in a very um, honest and organic way uh, here in ESRM. And you'll see this more and more as you go farther up into the upper division offerings of our courses. 
for example, um, here, here's uh, something that was inspired by some, some collaborations and research that I worked on. This is a lab activity we do in our, coast, in our conservation biology class, which is ESRM 313. This course, uh, this, this lab activity has students def creating and engaging in stakeholder processes to design marine protected area networks. And so the students are using the computers to evaluate different optimization routines. I found when I, we originally started to do this and students were assigned the role of perhaps oil and gas extraction or, or a tour boat operator or what have you, they sort of did it. But when I started bringing hats in and giving people hats and assigning them roles based on their hats, they got much more engaged and within a few minutes were, were actively arguing their roles. And so it really helped to make uh, this experience uh, much more realistic and, and a better learning environment. We do all kinds of stuff. I'll talk briefly at the end of this talk today about um, some of our roadkill work, which began as a, a class and still primarily is a class activity, again, in this case, in, from our conservation biology class. As you get farther and farther up in the ESRM curriculum, we do more and more work outside of the classroom. And our classes are taught outside, we do lab activities outside. In this case, this is uh, some of my students that are surveying the inner tidal up in San Luis Obispo County, where they are uh, measuring the diameter of um, owl limpets in a, in a protected area. Areas outside this protected area, these limpets, these little one-shelled mollusks are relatively small. In these protected areas where people can't harvest them, they're actually much bigger. So you can use the size of these individuals as an assay for human access to a particular part of the coastline. And so my students are learning how to do that. We, do, we um, are a small program, but we do a fair amount of international work. This is some of my uh, research and scholarship in Turkey, where I historically have gone twice a year uh, for, for several years. And this is me giving some CSUCI bling to uh, the gentleman there in the center with the blue tie is the then governor of the province where we work. This is in eastern Turkey, um, far eastern Turkey. And then the gentleman with the, the green spotted tie is the then mayor of the town where our nonprofit is based. Uh, because we go far away and sometimes when I need to be teaching, we also uh, do a lot of uh, telepresence work. And so, for example, ESRM was the entity that piloted using uh, podcasting for teaching here at CSUCI, and we uh, have a strong presence on iTunes. So if you guys want to check out some of our international podcasts or just any of our regular classes or, or our uh, seminar series, you just simply surf on over to, to iTunes iTunes U, if you can, or just regular iTunes work, and just type in ESRM and search, and you'll find a whole variety of classes and, and groupings of podcasts. So if you're thinking about maybe an upper division course and you're wondering if it'd be worth taking, um, many of those courses have podcasts that are up, up uh, on iTunes U. You can go check that out yourself. And you can, all those things that are there are free to stream or to download to your computer or mobile device. We're engaged with a broad range of research here in ESRM. This is uh, my col colleague, uh, Dr. Josip Kusak, who was here on campus about two and a half years ago, and you can watch some of his podcasts and lectures to our students. This is uh, an example of the kind of work we do to um, figure out how to better uh, plan and manage uh, wildlife and mitigate human wildlife encounters. This is a female wolf we've just uh, uh, captured. She triggered a leg, uh, leg hold trap and she's uh, hung up there. And Dr. Kusak has just used a, not a gun, we don't call it a gun, we're not allowed to have guns in Eastern Turkey. It's a, uh, a medical instrument. It's a, it's a medication delivery device. And so we've just darted that, that uh, young lady and she's going to go to sleep. We're going to go over, measure her, put on a GPS collar where we can track her movements and give her a little injection to wake her up and she'll run off into the forest. And we can use the the data from that caller to measure how far she goes, where does she go to a certain place on a certain time of day, etc., and use that to get a better estimate, one, of the population size of wolves in eastern Turkey and bears and the other things we work on, um, but also to, to really um, engage with the public and show them how many things there are and actually where their territories are. 
so we don't need to necessarily be going out and obliterating these populations willy-nilly. This is another example of uh, class-based research. In this case, this is our sustainable seafood project. This is um, uh, Lisa, one of Lisa Cox, one of our uh, graduates who now works as a federal employee down in San Diego, doing all kinds of cool stuff, uh, uh, working on um, uh, environmental education and all kinds of neat stuff. Uh, here she's uh, doing a survey in San Luis Obispo County. Um, of the seafood offerings at this particular uh, establishment and we're seeing where, geographically where the seafood item originated from um, and a whole variety of other things. Uh, this project has been going on for eight years now. Now while we teach you guys important research skills and methodologies and all that kind of great stuff, um, we also spend a lot of time um, working with you guys on developing your professional skills. So in this case, this is uh, another one of our uh, alumnus. Uh, Jerry now works for the Mountains uh, Recreation and, Conserva and Conservation Authority. Excuse me. When he came to my lab, he was a great guy, but, but very quiet. Very quiet, very demure guy. I am not very quiet. I am not very demure. And so um, sometimes students uh, like Jerry, who tend to be more sedate, are sometimes a little intimidated by uh, me. I don't know why they would be, <laughs> but they sometimes are. Um, Jerry's great. He's a great example of what um, our students can do. Um, l really involved with, the, with research, always helping out, always helping out, getting more and more responsibilities as the months and years go by, uh, doing more and more stuff. Eventually gets to the point where he starts to create the analyses of our research, take those analyses to, present, to conferences and present them. In this case, this is a presentation at the Chancellor's Office about some of our seafood work. And so we really, um, should you guys choose to take up those offers, we, we offer a great variety of ways where you guys can build your professional skills, not only in the field or the lab, but um, in, in many different venues. Uh, we do a lot of service. And again, this, this, in, this plays and in, 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 in feeds back upon itself with all these other co topics. In this case, this is a, um, a state seafood panel that I sit on. This is up in, this particular meeting is up in Monterey. Not only do we take you guys out, into, out of the classroom, out into the field, we also take you guys um, into different management settings. In this case, this is Santa Monica Seafood. This is the largest uh, wholesale seafood distributor, um, at least in our part of the western U.S., uh, one of the most state-of-the-art facilities here in Rancho Dominguez, so our students are walking around looking at the processing, looking at the uh, item, um, uh, inventory and management software, all kinds of aspects about the delivery of seafood uh, to folks from everywhere from Arizona to San Diego and up the coast of California, uh, out actually all the way to Las Vegas, these guys. We also are, um, one of our hallmarks are our trips that we uh, take. We, we've been fortunate enough to be able to find funding to take you guys on. In this case, this is our institutionally related activities funded trip. We've been doing this every year for the last eight years. This is our trip, my annual trip to Louisiana. It's a class. You guys can sign up for ESRM 492. The applications are due uh, for, for this coming spring's class uh, in early November. You send an application in. Uh, have a faculty recommend you, and if you're selected, I take you guys. Um, school pays two thirds the cost; you pay one third the cost, which this year will be about six seventy-five or so, somewhere in that that order of magnitude. Um, and uh, it's a three-unit class. We have uh, nighttime lectures as, as by way of preparation, and you guys learn all about what happened with Hurricane Katrina and Rita, what happened with the Deepwater Horizon, and how the Gulf Coast has responded and is responding to these stressors. Not only those stressors, stressors, but other things such as wetland loss due to levying of the Mississippi, all kinds of other things. We spend about half of our time doing uh, this work in, in this swamp about 10 miles south of the city of New Orleans proper that we are essentially uh, restoring and monitoring. We're, we're in effect the, the consultants for this, this uh, endeavor. We spend about half our time, time in the field here. The other half of the time we used to spend rebuilding houses, um, but for the last, oh, five, six years, we actually, um, instead, since everybody's sort of run out of money to rebuild, um, we install, food guard, install community food gardens in poor neighborhoods. 
um, across Plaquemines and Orleans Parish. And then most nights we go out to see uh, different uh, uh, colleagues of ours. Um, we do the History of Louisiana through food. We have a six-hour cooking class with a chef friend of ours. We meet with Pulitzer Prize winning reporters. We meet with a whole host of uh, friends that are jazz and blues musicians and really get into um, the culture of this area. And it, this really is a service learning trip. It's, it's about going and helping these folks recover, but also really you guys learning why the recovery has happened the way it's happened, uh, getting into the political issues, the policy issues, the management issues, the ecological issues, the historical issues that are behind the coastal management as it has unfolded along the Gulf Coast. Um, I go. I take students there. Uh, Don Rodriguez, uh, my colleague who's on sabbatical right now, so he, he can't uh, give a guest lecture to you guys. But um, he usually every other year used to take students to Mexico, and then because of the security situation there, we had to sort of change that up. So we've started now going to Costa Rica. So we take students to Costa Rica every other year and do a similar type thing. Um, should our Cook Islands trip get funded, that would be yet another example of, of these types of international trips. So um, I, I really strongly encourage you guys to please consider coming on our trip or at least one of the other uh, great IRA funded trips that uh, we do every year. Um, we keep going and we do all kinds of things in all parts of the state. In this case, this is my students in my coastal class uh, exploring robots and robotics up at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Here's an example of my students. Uh, do, so we do all this work internationally and all around, um, and sometimes we give the impression that that's all we do, but the bulk of our work is actually here in Southern California. So here are some of my students doing insect monitoring in our coastal dunes here to check the health of this system. We do a lot of field work, print, although all, all throughout the year, but especially in spring and summer. These are my students here um, uh, processing some of that field data, in this case, insect traps back in the lab. Now, the, the field stuff tends to be more uh, specified as to when we go, but processing lab samples is uh, definitely something you can work around your schedule. Uh, all kinds of partnerships. I was just with uh, Peter, the, the, the gentleman over there on the right, Peter Brand. Uh, on campus a couple weeks ago where we're working to secure additional funding to do a two and a half million dollar restoration of Cam Park. And so these partnerships are great for both um, uh, for us able to being able to help our partners and agencies and the general public but also sometimes in cases like this it allows for funding to come back to campus that we can ultimately use to um, hire you guys as student researchers. And then a lot of our uh, a lot of our work has been um, greatly appreciated by various groups. In this case, this is the Ventura County Board of Supervisors uh, um, graciously uh, awarding us uh, um, an award for, for some of the great work we've been doing in the coastal zone. Uh, a lot of, again, as we get older and, and get more into our upper division courses, you get more experiences to do unique things. In this case, this is our students in what is now, just underneath what is now the bridge over into campus over Long Grade Creek. You hear my students are designing in my restoration uh, design course. They're designing a stream restoration that we eventually would plant and, uh, and that was planted about two years ago now. So, so you have all these great opportunities to get uh, great resume building things. Even if you're not an ESRM person, there's all kinds of ways to stay involved either as a minor or, or just as a, another, another person across campus. Um, one of the neatest is our spring lecture series that's offered um, usually every other week in the springtime where we have all kinds of great uh, presentations on a host of topics that uh, are, are targeted at the general public so all of this is definitely approachable by folks that uh, are ESRM but also people that are not ESRM majors. The next thing I want to talk about is the importance of this interdisciplinary perspective that we try to um, drill into you guys here in ESRM. So the example that I want to show is, is, a, is an example where I was failing to take a real broad uh, look at the problem and just about everybody failed to take a real broad look at the problem, at least initially. So the example I want to talk about is the um, phenomenon that was a deep water horizon. So I um, run a, a national working group that was, has been looking at the effects of this. 
and this obviously happened, uh, the blowout was in April of 2010, so it was almost four and a half years ago now. Almost everyone had an incor incorrect frame of reference when it came to this event, myself included. Everyone was getting it wrong including Conan O'Brien. Officials at BP have filed permits to once again drill for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, BP said it's easier than ever to find oil in the Gulf because most of it's now on top of the water. <laughs> they told them to scoop it up and just put it in. <laughs> Good. There's... There's an oily seagull in there, over there who's not clapping. <laughs> so, all kinds of humor about this stuff. That was completely wrong, what uh, Conan just said there. Um, and and it, one of many things that helped feed our misunderstanding of what was going on. The reality is, we'll get to that in a second, but the reality is once the blowout happened, we were totally screwed up. We had no great choices once once that event happened. Every option that we tried to do or, or, or could have tried to do had some kind of downside, had some kind of trade-off. The best possible answer is here at the top of my graph, which is to simply uh, cap the flow of oil and stop it from getting into the ocean in the first place. And that's what everybody was trying to do. It eventually takes us, you know, um, almost two more than two months to, to get that done. As we go down in my list here, the uh, trade-offs get bigger and bigger and they're, they're less ideal. So the next best thing, if we couldn't capture the oil, excuse me, couldn't cap the well, would be to capture the oil with some kind of giant vacuum, um, constrict the movement of the oil to be relatively contained, and then aid in the capture with something like, say, a boom, as you see in the bottom of this picture, with some type of giant uh, salad spinner, if you will. These are the kind of things that Kevin Costner was uh, famously uh, promoting. Uh, all kinds of different things, including th uh, things such as absorbance, such as um, tubes or bales of hay or even bags of human hair that some people have uh, were talking about as, as being great oil absorbers, with the whole idea being to separate the oil from the water into some other uh, container or, or attach some other substance and then you can remove that container or remove that substance from the ocean. Next would be to not maybe eliminate the oil per se but to turn it into a less toxic form to somehow transform the oil and the most uh, common method here was with dispersants and corrects it being the the most uh, commonly used one. Now there, there are fancy things that we were using but in reality, it's not a huge amount removed from your dishwashing detergent. The idea being if you have an oily spaghetti pan, you try to wash it, it feels greasy. You rub it with a sponge and it still feels greasy. If you put a little uh, detergent onto your sponge and then rub it on there, that detergent essentially takes those big globules of oil and makes them broken up such that they can be surrounded by uh, water molecules and therefore uh, washed away more easily, removed from the surface, or in the case of the Deepwater Horizon, hopefully made more available for microbial uh, degradation. You could also do things like burn it, as you see in this photo. So this black smoke is, is taking liquid oil and turning it into, and combusting it and burning it, and turning it into effectively soot. So there's bad things with soot, but the idea is that soot is thought to be less toxic and, le and less of a problem than the oil on the surface. With the example of combustion, we did almost no combustion. Um, we had to have the exact right sea surface conditions, had to not be windy, etc. And as you can tell, uh, right here next to the give up sign, this is a boat with a person for scale. This is a very small amount of oil being burnt here. The last option was to simply give up. No one wanted to do that. Now, as we were going forward, one of the clear winners pretty, pretty quickly seemed to be the dispersants. And so, hey, this is a great, great idea. We all knew what was going on. We all knew that the oil was going to go to the surface, and if we didn't add these dispersants, it would get there to the, to the surface much more quickly. And initially, people were saying, the world is going to end, the world is going to end, the Gulf is going to die. Oh, my God. BP is going to destroy the whole northern Gulf of Mexico. Worst 
disaster in Amer environmental disaster in American history, et cetera, et cetera. Then, as we were getting on into the uh, into the event in, in the later days, people started to notice that things were bad, but they weren't, you know, kind of end of the world apocalyptic uh, scenarios. And so people started saying, "Huh, what's going on?" Oil absolutely got to the coastline, but not that much uh, compared to what was released. And so people said, ah, the answer is these dispersants work because we totally know what's going on. At the same time, we started doing various things like building some sand barrier islands, which mostly went to uh, uh, political donors to different um, politicians uh, and their friends. And they said, uh, you know, we're not, we're, not, we're not stupid folks down here. We know what happens. You mix oil and water and it goes to the surface. we got to deal with that right now. So this is what they said. They said, oh, my God, we know what happens with oil and water. Here comes oil out of the bottom. Bloop, 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 bloop. It goes to the surface. And oh, my God. So because the oil didn't go to the surface, we must have been super smart and used this dispersants. And this totally took care of all the problem. This is what actually happened. This is a much more accurate representation of what happened with the Deepwater Horizon. The oil, at that depth of, at which it was released, um, if it's just oil, it's actually uh, not positive. It does not float to the surface. It's too dense. Add to that the fact that the oil coming out of the ground was very high, highly pressurized, a lot of turbulence out of the opening, very warm, and a huge amount of methane was gassing up. In fact, this was mostly a methane blowout with a little bit of oil mixed in. And so that was going, in this case, what's happened is this, this uh, has left the bottom of the tank and it's gotten to be neutrally buoyant and it's, it's hovered there at this discontinuity at a thermocline or, or pycnocline, um, something there in the ocean. That's what actually happened on the right. Our first signals that something maybe not normal at least with regards to our normal uh, experience with oil spills was going on, was this. This is one of my colleagues, Mandy Joy, from the University of Georgia. She has uh, long cored the bottom of the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, doing all kinds of studies. And she always finds at least some macroscopic life, some life that you can see uh, without needing a microscope. So a worm or a snail or something. And if we look on the left-hand side, we see a sample f that was far from the Deepwater Horizon, which is the kind of uh, core you'd see from anywhere. We've basically taken a tube, jammed it into the mud at the bottom of the ocean, and, and pulled that, that tube up. In the middle, getting on, um, a little bit uh, closer to the Deepwater Horizon, we're starting to see some little oily, snotty film on the top of the uh, sediment. And as we get uh, close closer towards the deep water horizon, we're starting to see this kind of stuff, which is inches of thick oily snot. And in this case on the right, nothing macroscopic alive. And she, out of hundreds and hundreds of cores she'd taken, she um, reported never finding uh, a core without something uh, you know, big and alive in it. So this hints at something was going on. The problem was me. The problem were people like me. I worry about wetlands. I work on wetlands, and you know, uh, wetlands in, in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast are, are heavily impacted, disappearing at an incredibly high rate. And so, I am very worried about them. Many people are very worried about them. So as the Deepwater Horizon was happening, people like me were saying, "Oh my gosh, we got to save the wetlands. Our wetlands are going to get screwed up from this event. Oh my God, save the wetlands." We took. I took our old paradigm. The Deepwater Horizon was the first of its kind blowout. We've never seen anything like this before in human history. Nevertheless, I was using the most familiar model that I had that, that we've developed after years and many, many, many uh, ship um, ripping open, you know, ship grounding, pipeline breaks, everything in shallow water. So the general story here is we, we have a release that oil, some of that oil flops onto the sediment, but mostly it floats right up to the surface, accumulates at the surface. Some of it will volatize and go into the atmosphere. And then as the, the, the currents bring it on shore, it's going to oil our littoral beaches, our wetlands, etc. All I did, all we did initially, was take that model and move it to um, 
uh, a deeper depth. And we thought that's what was going to happen. Turns out I was wrong. We were totally wrong. This is the new model of deep water oil spills. This is what actually happened. We had very aggressive use of dispersants, which again, knowing what we knew at the time, was a great decision. The aerial application of dispersants is something we've been doing for decades. The unique thing was the subsurface deployment via ROVs and, and tubes and pipes. Great idea. The idea, idea was to squirt this dispersant right into the well, right above the wellhead, right where it's going to be maximally mixed and in theory maximally effective. So that was a great idea. As, this is go, as the uh, event progresses and, and the continual flowing of oil uh, continues, um, we start to discover something strange. Around 1400 to 1200 meters, the actual wellhead was about at uh, 1500 meters. We start noticing at about 1200 to 1400 meters the, something. Not sure exactly initially what it is, but it's this layer of stuff. What we now know is that was a, a dispersed layer of methane and oil that was hanging out, at, just like that video I showed you, at, at, at essentially neutrally buoyant at this depth. Now, uh, my working group has some disagreements about this. It's unclear how much of that was caused by the dispersants. Clearly the dispersants caused some of that oil to be better dispersed, better broken up, and more likely to, in effect, become part of this subsea plume. Um, but it's also clear that even with no dispersants, a very large proportion of this oil coming out of the bottom would never have ever made it to the surface. So here we were applying all, these, all this dispersants. We don't see a lot of uh, proportionally speaking, very much oil on the surface, and we pat ourselves on the back saying, hey, this dispersants is totally the idea. Dispersants, I would just remind you really quickly, are toxic and have a lot of problems associated with them. Um, they're generally used because they're thought that um, the benefit of dispersing oil and reducing, in effect, the toxicity of the oil is worth it. All of these decisions, all of these management decisions hinge fundamentally on the trade-offs. What's worth it, what's not. And when we don't have the full picture of what's actually happening, we cannot make an informed decision in terms of the trade-offs. So, okay, what happens is we have this dispersed plume. Now we have a lot of methanogens, um, methane-eating microbes, that uh, are, are typically excellent eaters of little pieces of methane. Fantastic scavengers of these things. They search out the little teeny single molecule and they gulp, they gulp it down and they they, they go to town. The other problem, the first problem is all, uh, a lot of the politicians said they knew exactly how oil behaved. Obviously they did not know how oil behaved. Um, and secondly, many of them don't believe in evolution. So that's another problem because we actually saw evolution of the microbial community here in the water column, probably through at least seven major uh, population cycles over the course of this blow up. But in any event, we had the, these, these population of oil eaters, methane eaters, if you, uh, and they were going to town on this oil, they actually under they experience selection pressure to not be selective methane hunters and eaters. So they became a fat guy on the couch eating Doritos, dumping the bag of Doritos into his mouth with all a bunch of the crumbs and chips rolling onto his chin and onto his big fat belly, and they were just in heaven because they just had bags and bags and bags of Doritos. Everything is fine. But now, go on uh, into the later summer, and we finally get the the well capped. All of a sudden overnight that supply of oil and methane is turned off. All of a sudden these, these microbes that have evolved to be um, uh, not efficient scavengers of methane now have to, are suddenly depleting all their resource, all their food. What are they going to do? And one of the things that tends to happen when these microbes get stressed out with just about any, any um, unicellular guy is they'll start to get leaky. They'll leak some of their, their uh, cellular constituents. And this leaky stuff starts to come out and, and be sort of like snot, uh, one of the contributors of so-called marine snow. And this starts to bond together with little globules of oil and then they globs together with that glob, etc. 
and this stuff then eventually starts to come out and sink down to the bottom and is, is transferred to the sediments. So we have this huge impact to things that are trying to live in the midwater column there because they're having to swim through methane and oil. That's toxic to a lot of things. Secondly, this stuff is getting dumped, is getting rained out on the bottom of the ocean. When we talk about the impacts, um, it, it uh, is important to talk about what we thought would happen versus what actually did happen. So here I've, I'm going to show you a little model which talks about uh, the littoral fringe, the edge of the coastline, the water column in the bottom, and we're going to talk about a few different representative uh, ecosystem, uh, e ecological communities, sandy beach, mud flat, salt marsh, and oyster reef. When we talk about the water column, we talk about the very, very thin lip, lid of the water, which is 50 centimeters or uh, or, or, or less, and then down onto uh, the deep water column. Same thing with the, with the benthos. Super shallow um, bottom next to the coast on down to the bottom. This is a radar diagram, so this is um, a chart like you would have seen. The difference is here there's only one axis. The axis goes from the center out away. So at the center point we have zero value, and as we go away, as we radiate out towards the edge of the circle, the values get higher and higher. And so uh, through a bunch of work of talking with experts and, and, and our knowledge of how oil spills work, this is typically the distribution of uh, where we thought impacts would be from an oil spill, from a traditional oil spill. So the salt marsh is particularly heavy hit, the very surface of the ocean is very heavily hit, etc. This is what we believe actually happened in reality where the vast majority of the impacts were in the midwater column and in the, the, the deep bottom of the ocean. Now if we ask, so I'm going to take uh, the same figure and I'm, I've just changed the scale. So the data is all the same, just so I can show you the next things. I, um, I just, I just uh, elongated the scale a bit. Now, uh, the agencies that, had, that jumped in initially and started funding folks to do some kind of impact or, or, or early impact or pre-impact studies should be complemented. These include the National Science Foundation, which gives out so-called rapid awards, which are not, not gazillion million dollar awards, but you know, typically on the order of tens of thousands of dollars, maybe a little more like hundreds of thousands occasionally. And instead of going through the regular many months process, nine months, a year of review, um, it's more like a, a week or two of review, with the idea being that the NSF can get money rapidly into the hands of researchers right after the wildfire comes through, right after the hurricane comes through, etc. And so they did that here for the Deepwater Horizon. This is where they spent their money. This is where, so a bunch of researchers said, give me money, I want to monitor this before the oil comes ashore, and then I want to monitor the effect of the oil shore. So you see that people like me, screaming the wrong thing, freaking us out about our salt marshes, got the lion's share of the funding. Very little went to, um, comparatively little went to the water column or the bottom of the ocean. Another government program is the so-called NERDA program, which is run by NOAA, which is designed to quantify the, the damages associated with that oil spill. Now, NERDA does a bit better. They spend a bit on salt marsh, but, but they're, they're, uh, they're better. But even those guys miss uh, focusing their efforts, at least initially, on the, the, the deeper water column and the bottom of the ocean. If we don't monitor this, it's incredibly hard, if not impossible, to accurately gauge the effect of this oil spill. So because we, don't we didn't have an effective interdisciplinary model, weren't thinking of this problem from first principles like we teach you to here in ESRM, um, we, we missed an opportunity to, to really tease apart this and, and really more fully understand the real story going on. The second thing is we've tended to focus on things like fish and birds that uh, have been indicated in marine mammals that have uh, things like um, uh, sea otters and things that we've focused on traditionally. Another thing we teach you in ESRM is to uh, think about how the public sees these issues. In this case, what's probably a better indicator organism would be one that would engage the public. If I talk about the jellyfish that were killed through the, from this oil spill, most people probably wouldn't care. Right? Jellyfish are kind of icky, they're kinda, they, don't, they don't really taste that great, and you know, who cares about them? 
If we instead pick something like, say, oh, a sperm whale that uh, does spend some time at the surface, so if we had a lot of oil at the surface, you know, we'd be getting his blowhole oiled and, and that would be bad, breathing in, breathing in oil would hurt him and all that kind of stuff. But also importantly, these sperm whales feed down deep. Here's an example, now this is not from the oil spill, but this is just another, uh, this is an, an oil company ROV and they're out here and the guy's driving the ROV around, he's checking the wellhead, making sure all the pipe is, uh, is secure and everything's good. And they're filming this and the guy says, hey, what's that? And he pulls back the camera a little and whoa, there's a giant sperm whale swimming right in front of the camera. So that's at 900 meters. So these guys uh, clearly can go all around. So if instead of talking to people like me, talking about, oh my gosh, the jellyfish, if we chose something that is both iconic to the public, we can perhaps better communicate the true impacts of the oil spill. So this is a critter that would, that in theory, should integrate all of the aspects uh, and all the dimensions of the oil spill, and yet is also something the general public can appreciate and understand. The next example I'll run through really quick before we have to stop here today is the is an example of a project that started um, in one of my classes and has been going on is primarily driven by my uh, our conservation biology class and this is the uh, study looking at ecological fragmentation fragmentation is when we had a contiguous thing let's say a, a contiguous patch of forest and then we split it into two patches classically it would be with a road. All, and, and if an organism needs to be, uh, it needs to get to both of those patches to complete its life cycle, it has to now cross that road. And exa for example, roads do all kinds of things, change nutrient flows, change water flows, sound environments, all kinds of stuff. But one of the most obvious things that we don't need any fancy equipment, don't need a PCR machine, we can just get in our car and drive and see, is roadkill. So this picture, for example, is a badger right on, on Wanimi Road. And when I first passed this, I said, that's a weird looking cat. And I turned around and came back and said, man, that looks like a badger. And I, I checked it out and, oh my God, it is a badger. So this is right in the middle of our farming areas. So I didn't realize we had badgers down the Oxnard Plain until I started this study. Now this study was motivated by uh, data such as this. This is an incredibly scary graph to me. This is some data from about a decade ago where these guys went and compiled essentially just the, the major roads in the lower 48 states, the contiguous United States. They didn't get every single little small dirty uh, you know, patch of dirt, um, uh, forest service road, et cetera. This was just you know, easy to get at roads off of databases. And what they found was super scary. What they found was, so on, on, this, on the x-axis here, we have distance from a road going from uh, zero to, to 6,000, to, to six kilometers and the proportion of the total land area that is within that distance to a road. So we see, for example, is if we talk about uh, half of the land, half of the land in the United States is about, um, is, is less than 500 meters from a road. I'll say that again. Half of the land in the United States of America is less than 500 meters from a road. This is crazy. This is totally crazy. If we talk about, um, say, a, a kilometer from a road, um, something like a little bit, uh, almost a little bit south of 80% is within a kilometer of a road. That is crazy. This is what that looks like, or, or sorry, um, uh, this has real consequences for wildlife. In this case, we're looking, this is a little, this data is a bit old, but it, it serves to make the point. These are radio collar position data for mountain lions. And so here we are here on campus. Here's the Santa Monica Mountains. We're bounded on this side by Los Angeles, bounded on this side by Pacific Coast Highway, here by the Oxnard Plain, and here by the, one, the, the death corridor that is the 101 freeway. Uh, these uh, shapes mark out the uh, territories of different uh, individual mountain lines. And we see is these guys don't cross. We now, we now have a little bit of evidence that every once in a while they, they must, but it's very, very rarely. Do these guys here in the mountains cross over and get into the Simi Hills and up across into the Los Padres and all that kind of stuff? Similarly, um, mountain lions on the landward side of the 101 also never or very rarely come and cross this, this barrier. So roads are very, very real. Here's what roads look like in Ventura County. 
Uh, yellow here is uh, a 100 meters on either side uh, creek or, or, or um, uh, boundary uh, around each road. And then the orange is 500 meters uh, within a road. And what you see is this is massive. This is insane. If you're a little critter and you're here in our part of the county, you, you pretty much have to cross a road if you want to go anywhere. If you're up here in the northern part of the county, in the, in the Los Padres and that kind of stuff, you have, you have a decent chance of being able to move around without getting smushed on a road. But these guys, the vast majority of our county, it's, a, it's very, very difficult. And this road network is an absolutely real conservation challenge. So what we found is looking at the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, that's the pink area here, our data, now what we do is we go out and we survey these guys and we do this um, and we go from intersection A to intersection B. Our students do this. And we record everything we see. We also record when we do the survey and see nothing dead. Typically people will record that, oh, here is a, a deer was killed here, which is great because we know that at least um, that uh, at least that road is deadly to deer, or potentially deadly to that to deer right there. We don't really know what, how to interpret that. Our data is unique. Our data actually records the number of times that uh, we looked for it. So in other words, if we had if we had a deer kill, was that the first time? Did you look for deer once and you saw a deer kill on that road, or did you look 300 times and see a kill one time? Right, totally different picture. So we can use our data to get very accurate estimates of the kill of critters on these roads. And we currently have about 55 uh, segments of road that we survey across the county, from uh, a county also into Los Angeles and a little bit into Santa Barbara County. On the Santa Monica Mountains, that translates just large-bodied critters, so big things, things like deer and, and, and uh, you know, coyotes and such. We're and, and only looking at the major roads in the Santa Monica Mountains. We're losing something like 5,000 animals a year just to cars. Huge impact. If we talk about the overall county of Ventura, we're losing something uh, uh, like 14,000 large-bodied animals to collisions with cars. It goes up to insane numbers if we start talking about small animals like squirrels and rabbits. This data is great. So we did this primarily as an exercise and as a teaching opportunity, but then starting a few years ago, uh, different managers and, and, and you know, folks from Caltrans and other places have started to say, hey, uh, this is really useful. Can we, can we have some of this data? Can we, can we get this data? So it's great. So our students that are doing this class project are actually tangibly helping move forward the management of uh, our, our regional area. And it's great. And so these are, this is another suite of opportunities that ESRM provides you. You guys get to do all this throughout. You guys get to build up your resume throughout. The one thing I really want to hammer home to you guys, even if you're not an ESRM major, whatever you do, please, before you graduate, go work with a professor. Go work with a faculty member. Do some scholarship. Get some experience. What people are going to ask is, one, do you have a degree? Yes, no. The second thing they're going to ask is, what have you done? Sometimes that means what classes have you taken. More often than not, they want to know what have you done. They want to know what projects you've done. And the thing that really, honest to God, distinguishes our graduates from just about um, all of our other uh, fellow universities, in our, at least in our area, is, is the great emphasis that we place on field experience and on actual, actual practical uh, field science and, and identifying plants. How do you survey for animals? How do you do this stuff? And that's really what uh, gives you guys the edge in terms of getting a, a job with the Park Service or the county or going on to graduate school or whatever it is you, you wish to do. Uh, and this has also become a, a, a mobile phone app that doesn't work now thanks to the most recent uh, update with the iPhone that I need to fix it. But basically, um, we can all, we're bringing the general public into this as well. So really what we've been trying to do, what we, uh, we, we do do, in terms of ESRM is really try to lay the foundation for you guys and take this raw material, this, this raw stuff, um, configure it, melt it, shape it, sculpt it, and turn it into something that is uh, very useful for dealing with our current management challenges and giving you a little bit of this, a little bit of that, so that you really understand the economic context, the policy context, uh, uh, the human dimensions context to natural resource management challenges. 
And so if, if you haven't considered uh, being an ASRM major, I hope you do consider that. If, if you're already set on your existing major, I think it's, it really is a fantastic minor to add to really help your marketability. So I'd hope you, you'd consider that. And uh, as you finish jotting down your notes there, um, you guys are more than welcome to get in touch with me. Uh, please do uh, talk to Dr. O'Hyrick, Dr. Rodriguez, whoever, and, and do get involved with the research. Send me an email whenever you'd like. Just please note I get about 200 to 300 emails a day, and it's really, really hard for me to keep up with my email. But uh, you're welcome to email me. If I don't respond, keep bugging me and come by my office hours. And thanks so much, you guys. And uh, I hope to see you in future ESRM classes. Thanks a lot.